For you all to be a part of such an incredible evening, I can say that when I was on campus as a college student, nothing like this was happening. And so it's really an honor to take part in a conversation that is put together and promoted and encouraged by young people. The first semester of my college experience was pretty challenging. Um, mental illness is something that doesn't run in my family. And so when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder one at the age of 17, our family nonetheless was sort of had the, had the carpet swept from underneath us. The first time when I was 17 and I went to a psychologist, the first question I was, asked her was, can someone just go crazy? You know, can people just lose their mind and absolutely go crazy? Because at 17, having going through a manic episode and having a lot of different symptoms that I had not previously had, I felt as though I was going crazy. And so I was hospitalized early on, um, just before my senior year of high school. So I had a manic episode, spent a week in a psychiatric hospital, and this word they were throwing around, this manic depression. And it felt so suffocating. They talked about this word and they talked about this woman named Erin that they thought had this manic depression. And so as the meds sort of started to wear off and I was able to come to and, and get some of my senses about me while I was in the hospital, I realized that they were talking about Erin and that person was me. And it was so perplexing to me because I didn't think that mental illness happened to people like me. I have this stereotype, this negative outlook, an ignorant assumption about what mental illness looks like. And I assumed that people who are living with mental illness experience drug or alcohol abuse, that they weren't in loving, kind homes like I was, that they weren't thriving in high school. And so the feeling of stigma was something that I experienced very early on, but it was really this internalized stigma. I labeled myself very much with some of those negative connotations. So after I was released, I spent my senior year of high school really trying to figure out who I was. When you're 17, all you wanna do is fit in. Right? You wanna be just like your peers. You want everybody to think that the world is well and you're thriving and you know people like you and you feel good about yourself. And I lived my entire senior year doing what I could to live in total silence, to keep anybody and everybody away, so that I could paste on this smile that everything was good in my world. Have any of you kind of hid behind the smile in that way? I know that I did for years, and guess what? It is exhausting. And so my senior year, I decided, well, I don't know about this whole manic depressive thing. They've you know, figured out that it's actually really old terminology, and we call it bipolar disorder. But I figured, well, hell, I don't have it, and I'm not taking meds for it. So my senior year, I went off my medication, which uh, if you know anything about those living with bipolar disorder and going on and off meds, it typically doesn't end well for them. So that first semester that I went to college, I actually only had about a three-week span of college, and it was so much fun. College in itself is really fun, but then when you tack on a manic episode on top of it, it's like a really good time. Unfortunately, the really good time came to an end because I was a danger to myself. I could have been a danger to others. The second manic episode I was experiencing put me in a place where I had really no connection to reality. I had no sense of, of who I was and what was real. So I was medically withdrawn from school and I entered my second psychiatric hospital. Now I share this with you about the early phases of my diagnosis because as a young person, I so deeply needed the adults and the teachers and the influences in my life to, to notice those signs, to look out for me, to be able to guide me of what do I do? Because I'm, I'm stuck in this mindset that I'm crazy and nobody understands and I'm always gonna feel depressed and I'm never gonna get better. And there was a lot of missed opportunities by those in the educa educational system for me. So in high school, not one of my instructors, not one of my teachers asked me why I had missed over a third of my school year. When I got to college and I was medically withdrawn, I went back to school, we heard that, you know what? 
Bipolar disorder is a mental illness and it's a disability. And so you should reach out to the Disability Resource Center. And I know that ASU has a fantastic DRC here on campus, so I certainly encourage you to do that. I wasn't so lucky 15, 16 years ago when I was in college. The Disability Resource Center at that time didn't have a real good understanding of how mental illness connected to needing accommodations in the classroom. And so, you know, I had my sheet of paper and I'd walk to my teachers and it didn't say, she's legit crazy bipolar. It just said, you know, Erin Kalanian needs accommodations regarding additional test time and the opportunity to potentially miss um, more classes, you know, depending on what I was doing with medication management and things such as that. And I recognize that living with an invisible disability is really challenging. I can only speak for myself, but I know that so badly, I wish I could just break both of my legs. If I was in a wheelchair with broken legs, I wouldn't have had to explain myself. You know, my peers could look at me and they would ask what they can do to help and if I'm hurting and they would open doors for me. But people don't necessarily respond that way when you're living with a mental illness. So I was really fortunate to get connected with services. I finally decided, you know what? I've got this medical condition. It's up to me to depict what the path is gonna look like. So I took medication and I've taken medication every single day since and I'm 34. The positive piece of that that I hope to share with you is that we all many times can feel victim to the diagnosis that we have. And I know for me, I felt as though I didn't have choice or agency or autonomy in the things that were happening to me. You know, I was frustrated about having to see a psychiatrist. I was frustrated that my mind and body weren't working the way that they did in previous years. But then I had a change of perspective when I was in college. By connecting with those on campus, by doing spring cleaning in my life, where I got rid of people who didn't love me and support me unconditionally, the good, bad, and the ugly. So if I needed friends to come over and help me because I was stuck in a cycle of self-harm, they would do that. I found friends where I could say, you know, hey, I'm changing medication, here's what I'm taking, here's some of the side effects I'm having. And you know what, I'm forgetting to take it before I go to bed, is that something you can help me out with? And guess what, they helped. They didn't judge me, they didn't shame me. And so as a young person, I was able to, to sort of build my support system. You know, I had my family, and now I'm building friends based on individuals who can love me and support me from a place of education, of understanding what mental illness is, and knowing that it's not a character flaw. I didn't do something horrendous in my life previously to piss off the man upstairs, and now I'm cursed with this horrible thing we call mental illness. It's something that I live with. It's not something that I feel as though I suffer from regularly. Do I have ups and downs? Absolutely. Once I graduated college, I recognized that my own mental health is in a much better place when I'm doing things for others that make me feel good. So I encourage people, if you're in that place where you're feeling like you don't have purpose, if you feel like you're struggling to kind of find your place in the world, reach down inside and find what those passions and interests are because I promise they are there. While you may feel like you're living in the beige phase, you know, the I feel nothing, I don't laugh, I don't cry, I have no personality, I don't know the things I like, don't give up because they're there. So I found myself being able to work with people who had experienced trauma, who were living with mental illnesses. And you know what I found out? People are incredibly resilient. When somebody walks a tough, dark, tragic path sometimes, they come out so significantly strong. And the stories that I've heard over the years of recovery and patience and you know, heroism really inspired me to, to, to sit back and think, you know what, maybe, even though I've accepted my diagnosis personally, maybe I can actually openly talk about it. You know, I've created this safe space within my own circle 
you know, my family, we talk about it, we laugh about it. I don't know, we laugh about mental illness. It feels so good. I've got the friends and support system that has supported me along the way. I have recognized what the red flags are. I've recognized what I needed to do to manage an eating disorder that I struggled with throughout college. And by doing all of those things, I've come to the place where I've recognized that, you know what, you can live and you can live fully with a mental illness. Whether it's bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or major depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever it is, I feel so privileged that I'm living with a disorder that is treatable. And so think about the place that maybe you're in or maybe the life of a loved one. Is it easy to come to the place where you stand on a stage and you sort of splay your heart out about some pretty challenging things that you've been through? No, it's certainly not easy. The path to get here was challenging. It took years of therapy, medication changes, lots of self-care, coming from a girl who was trying to re-identify who she was from a place of sheer sadness and suicidal ideations and depression and no self-esteem, to recognizing that, you know what? I'm not the only one who has struggled in this way. And so I decided after, you know, working with survivors of trauma and meeting other people living with a mental illness, I decided, you know, well, people are gonna talk about me doing crazy things in my past. I might as well just write about it because then I can make sure that they get it right. So I ended up, when I was 29, I published a book that I called Beautifully Bipolar, An Inspiring Look into Mental Illness. And I did that with intention. You often don't ever hear bipolar associated with a positive word such as beautiful. And I felt that through the struggle and through the pain, there was actually beautiful things that I found out about myself. I found out that I'm a lot stronger than I ever gave myself credit for. I found out that I met beautiful people along the way who had similar experiences and they're still standing too. I also titled it an inspiring look into mental illness because how many of you have ever Googled mental illness? How did that work out for you? It's so horrifying, right? It's like the worst of the worst cases come up and you know, certainly there are those stories. You know, there are the stories of, of pain and violence and loss and tragedy. But that doesn't speak for the vast majority of us who are living with a mental illness. That doesn't speak to, to the most common day in and day out of those of us who are, who are functioning and living in recovery. And so I wanted to join the community of people who are doing really, really great work around mental illness. And so some thoughts that I have to share with you about you know, encouraging you or your loved ones to get on a path of recovery is that it's not, you know, it's not this destination that you work for. Recovery is really, it's a process, it's a journey, and it's something that I live with and through and it's a part of me, and that is what makes me feel strong and empowered. I'm not cured, but I'm certainly living a really full, whole life. It takes a whole lot of work, but it is certainly possible. I also encourage you to lean into the discomfort. Talking about mental illness can be so incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, even when I read back through the book, some of the pages, I'm like, it makes me a little cringy because it can be uncomfortable. But when we're open and we're willing and we stand tall and talk about mental illness, guess what it tells the person who's in the back of the room, who's in that deep, dark place, and they think that not a person can see or hear them. It tells them that it's okay to talk about it, that they're not alone, that mental illness is real, it's common, it's treatable. So while it's uncomfortable to explore different types of therapies, it's uncomfortable to have to wait months for medications to start working. It's uncomfortable to have to tell a, new, a person in a new relationship or friends or employers that you're living with a mental illness. I read a statistic once that said that people in the workplace would rather have their bosses find out they have a criminal history and spent time in jail than that they have a mental illness. 
That's something we have to change. And fortunately, people living with mental illnesses, we have rights and we have protections as well. And so I'm fortunate to be a part of an organization like Mental Health America of Arizona that has programs specific to how can we talk about mental health in the workplace? Because I know nobody prepared me for that when I was in college. How can we talk to employers and help them recognize that, hey, if they pay attention to why their employees are taking time off, that stress and depression are the two biggest indicators of absenteeism, it's really actually productive and, and beneficial to the organization's bottom line. So lean into this discomfort and, and look at how mental illness may impact you biologically, physically, socially, because bipolar disorder is just this one piece of me over here. Right? It doesn't define who I am. I don't introduce my, myself to people and say, hi, my name is bipolar disorder, type one, diagnosed in 2001. No, we don't do that. I also encourage you to educate yourself. And if you're a family member, educate yourself. Because what education did for me was help normalize that I'm living with a brain disorder. And if I understand how that disorder impacts my life, I'm more likely to treat it in a way that's positive and productive for my own healing. One of the greatest sources of education that my family had was through the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We took, my family took the um, NAMI family to family class early on. My mom still has her binder. And, um, you know, because mental illness has an impact on anyone within an arm's reach of the person who is struggling, it's important for family to get help and for them to seek out the support and services that are available to them as well. I also have to tell you that if you're taking medication for mental illness and it's working, keep taking it. That's what it's there for. If medications aren't working for you, there's lots of other naturopathic medications and strategies and therapies that you can look into. But my messaging around that is just know that you deserve to be happy and stable and well, and you deserve to be in the driver's seat of whatever that treatment plan looks like for you. So if any of you are walking around on this campus feeling as though you may be invisible, feeling as though you aren't being seen, feeling as though you don't have the strength to get out of bed tomorrow, I ask that you do. I ask that you keep striving, you keep getting up each and every day and take advantage of the multitude of resources that are available here on campus and off campus and that you get the support you need. Do your best to find the words to describe how you feel. I know that finding the words was incredibly challenging at the time. And as I've gotten older and I've been able to, to label and identify what my experience has been, I was able to write down as an adult what I needed when I was in college. Here's what I need from you. Believe me. Believe me with your heart and your eyes and your ears. Know that this sadness is real for me. Understand that it makes it hard to move. Please know that I can't let everyone see me this way. Please don't, call, please don't stop calling. Please give me space, but not too much. I dread having to explain to you how I feel. And assigning words to feelings takes energy that I don't have. Hold me, sit with me in silence. Don't make me promise to follow through on plans or calls or visits with you. I want to, trust me. But the pressure of doing so may be too much and I can't stand to disappoint you. So I need you to do the following through, at least for now, until I get a little bit stronger. So for those of you who need that extra courage or kick of strength, please know that right here, right now, in this very room, you are surrounded by others who are just waiting to call out and waiting to help. So thank you for putting on such a great event and inviting me to participate.